Happy New Year. Man, it is close and you guys are here. You're starting off New Year's Eve well. I don't know how you're going to finish. Not my business, but you're starting off well. And I can't think of a better place to be than here with you guys right now. I was in Arkansas for the last couple of weeks visiting my granddaughter. And I have two boys there, a daughter-in-law and one of my son's girlfriends. But I'm still visiting my granddaughter now. Now that I have a granddaughter, she just turned two. We went down for her birthday. And she was celebrated three birthdays or four birthday parties and four Christmases. And for two weeks, all she did was get presents from everybody. Every morning she woke up, she was celebrated. She was getting something. And I wasn't there for the first day of normalcy after Christmas when she got up and was just another kid. I got to spoil her rotten. And my granddaughter, Emery, is getting bossy. She's two and she has lots of words. And um, the words that she uses are in context. She puts them together as in sentences and and she started telling me to be careful. That's what, she, that's what she says to me all the time when I drive. Be careful, Bapo. That's she calls me Bapo. And uh, I don't know if you guys, if it you know, rings, if you like it or not, but we were telling her to call me grandpa back when she was younger. And she said, Bapo, and um, it stuck. And so uh, Bapo has been uh, my name for a while. And this time we changed it. And now I've asked her to call me El Bapo, which I think is super cool. <laughs> So she's going, El Bapo, which to me, I don't know if it just has that ring to it. So she's like, El Bapo, be careful. El Bapo, be careful. And I'll drive and she's sitting in the back with joy and I'll turn a little bit and she's like, be careful, El Bapo, be careful. And I'm so, I mean, she's a perfect, you know, little bossy backseat driver. And I have a great time having these conversations with her. And I went to church with my son, my daughter-in-law's on the worship team at their church. And we were sitting in the parking lot, getting ready to go in. Emery's all geared up, looking pretty for Christmas Eve, Sunday morning. And um, right before I got out of the car, she picked me out of everyone in the car. And she said, Bapo, be careful. Merry Christmas. Be nice. <laughs> and my wife looked at me and said, exactly. That was it. That was all you need to know. So if you haven't heard that already, um, I just want to tell you, be careful. Happy New Year. Be nice. That's my advice from my two-year-old granddaughter and from myself as we enter 2024. Are you ready to go? Any New Year's resolutions? Any of you resolvers for New Year's? Raise your hands if you're a New Year's resolver. I am constantly disappointed by your lack of resolve. How about that? Every year I ask that question. Is there anybody in here? I will not ask you what your resolutions are, but is there anybody in here who wants to be a better person than they were last year. Anyone who wants to be a better person? Okay. Has there anybody who has decided how that might come about and made some resolutions to become a better person this year? Ah, you see, there may be a gap there and it's that resolve. It's that decision that bridges the gap. And the good news is it's not too late. I'm going to give you a pep talk today, but it doesn't just come from Rick. It comes from scripture it comes from the book of Hebrews. It's a book that was written by a Jewish author to Jewish Christians who'd left a life of legalism behind. They had rough pasts, pasts where they'd been judged, pasts where they'd been taught that they had to be good enough to earn God's favor. A rough kind of an upbringing for many of them. Most of them weren't at the elite, the top of the religious echelon and had been abused by the church. They'd had bad religious experiences. They'd been taught that they had to be good enough and look good enough and act good enough to earn God's favor. And in reality, it just wasn't true. And Jesus came to free everyone from that. And there's a book that was written and it was written by an unknown author. We know he was Jewish to a group of people who were trying to figure out how to get it done. What I wanna do is to start Hebrews 12 with you and talk to you about some advice for the new year that comes straight from scripture. It comes from my heart. I hope it lands well in your heart. And I hope that you resolve to live 2024 differently this year than maybe you've lived 2023. That the desire to be a better person would be met with the decisions to become a better person and that we would start living differently. So let's read together Hebrews 12 and let's break it down together. And let's see where we go. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The very first phrase is what I want us to start with. The person who wrote Hebrews, the author, was looking back at Hebrews 11, talking about all of the Old Testament Christians, the saints, the people who were followers of Judaism devoutly and looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and the lives that they'd lived and the faithfulness that they demonstrated. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and I don't know who the witnesses are in your life. I don't know if you've had great Christians who've surrounded you people who've gone before you, who've set examples of what true godliness and Christ-like character looks like. But these early Christians were thinking of people like Abraham, who followed God's call before he even knew who God was. Thinking of people like Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Daniel and David, people who had accepted the role of following God and living a life of faith without even knowing where this life was heading. A life of difficulty, a life of uncertainty as far as circumstance, but not as far as ultimate destination. Endured hardships, accusations, ridicule, and sometimes even death. But they did it faithfully. And the author of Hebrews is appealing to you and to I, saying, remember those who've gone before you. Remember those who've walked this life, who've lived this faith. They finished and they finished well. In the analogy here, the word picture is like a race. Now I hate to run. Any runners in here, anybody resolved this year is gonna be the year of running for you? You're gonna take up jogging maybe to lose a few. Anybody like to run? I've always been a little suspicious of people who run. I admire it, but I hate to run. I absolutely hate it. But the analogy of running sometimes is used quite often in the Bible to talk about the Christian life. And you're gonna see this here in this passage, that the analogy or the word picture of running is used. And you have to understand right off the bat that the word picture that's used here when we talk about running is not a sprint. The word picture that's used when we talk about running is a marathon. And depending on how you like to run, and you know, I, I do cardio, when I do cardio, it looks a whole lot more like walking. I like a weight vest when I walk. I don't like to run. But when I have chosen to run um, and do sprints, it looked a lot like this. I would go to the track, usually Sailorville track here, just really close to the church. And, and I would sprint as fast and hard as I can for as far as I can, which was like 40 or 50 yards. And then after I got done sprinting 40 or 50 yards, I would either lay or on the ground or hands on my knees and, and huff and puff and, and rest and, and wait and decide if I was gonna run again. And I would watch my watch and then eventually get up and, and I would sprint again and then I would stop and do it all over again. So I would sprint and stop and sprint and stop. And it's great for your health and great for your heart terrible for if you're wanting to, to arrive at a destination and demoralizing if you're as bad at it as, as I am. And the word that's used here in scripture for run is a marathon where there's a destination in mind, where you train and prepare yourself, where you implement things, you put them in your life to where you have a goal and you can run and be consistent and ultimately achieve that goal and that we look to the cloud of witnesses who've gone before us, the Old Testament full of them, we with the privilege and benefit of reading the New Testament, people like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, people like Stephen, stoned for his faith, but resolute in his commitment to our God. People in my life, like my grandmothers, like my father, like my first youth pastor, Dan Carter, who've gone before and have walked the race or jogged the race faithfully and either have or are making it to the end. So right off the bat, he's saying, be confident, it can be done. Now, some people say that they're standing there on the sidelines, all these saints who've gone before watching us. And I don't know if this will bring you comfort or not, 
But the people who've died in your lives, the people who've died in, in our world, are not up there watching us. Does that surprise anybody? That there's nothing in scripture that ever indicates or hints that anyone who's passed away is watching us right now. And there are many reasons theologically why we would believe this to be true, but there is no sadness or disappointment that they are experiencing. And I can promise you that if those faithful saints who have run the race and finished well were watching us, they would be full of, full of sadness and, and disappointment. And so in a sense, they're not standing there watching us run, but they're standing there waiting for us to finish so that when we cross the finish line, the end of our lives, they can cheer with us and say, welcome home, you did this, you ran the race, you were faithful, you kept the course. They show us that there is something to be looked forward to, that there's something at the end that's worth running for, something worth reordering or reorganizing your lives for. So the author says, therefore remember this great crowd of witnesses that have gone before you. And in light of that, he gives us a challenge and he says, I want you to do something. Now, before we get to the do something, he says, let us, let us, and you, my friend, are part of the us. This is my challenge. This is where it starts. I know it's New Year's Eve. It's the end of a long holiday season, but I just need you to lean in for a minute because this is the important part. Let us together run. Let us together run. Let us together run finish and finish well. Let us together leave a legacy behind that points people toward Jesus. Amen. So who are the us? Well, for the original audience who were reading or hearing this letter, they would have been devout Christians who had been devout Jews that were being persecuted for their Christianity. It could also have been some people who were on the fence intellectually where they believed that this Christian thing was true, but they just weren't 100% sure that they were all in, that they were going to give their lives to Jesus. And it occurs to me that there may be some folks here and certainly watching online who've arrived maybe at that same spot where you're kind of stuck. The author of Hebrews says, let us. And the us is very inclusive as Jesus says, anyone who wants to come can come but it's also very exclusive because the only person who's part of the us is the person who's chosen to become a follower of Christ, who's confessed their sin and asked for forgiveness, who has believed who Jesus is and become part of the family of God. And the author says, let us together. And so there's a challenge here that's very, very subtle, but it's really important because my first question would be, are you in? And if you're not in, then get in. Have you become a follower of Christ? Or are you thinking about it? Are you intellectually leaning in? Not 100% sure that you're ready to, to devote your life, to, to dedicate your heart, to take that step of faith. And you've been waiting, you've been watching, you've been trying to decide. What better time to decide than on the beginning of a brand new year where we put things in our life to become a different person, where we can see God do things in our lives that you've never seen before for his glory and not for ours. And so my appeal to you today would be, why not now? So if you're one of those who may be on the fence, I wanna invite you to get in so that we together can run. And it's exceptionally simple, but exceptionally profound. You simply acknowledge to God that you have sinned just like all of us and fallen short of God's glory. One sin, 10 sins, a hundred sins, a million sins, we've all sinned, every one of us. And any of us who has sinned, since we're born sinful and we're pretty good at it in our own right, has to ask forgiveness for our sin. And when we do, the Bible promises us that God's faithful and right to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
You may not know how to do that because prayer seems weird because we make it weird, not because it is weird. You may have talked to your spouse this morning. Maybe you texted your kids. Maybe you uh, had a conversation at the cafe on your way in. Maybe there was a greeter at the door who said, hey, good morning. And you might've said, happy new year. Good morning to you. Prayer is just that simple. God has installed in you the ability to communicate with you and the desire to communicate with you. And all you have to do is think or say a thought toward him and he receives it. He hears it. And that prayer is the most important prayer you can ever pray. It's the prayer of beginning. It's the first start. Forgive me for my sin. I failed you. I've had thoughts, actions, and attitudes displeasing to you and I don't want to sin anymore. I believe who Jesus is, even though I don't know everything, I know enough, and I want to learn more, and I want to give you my life, and I want to follow you. I want my life to belong to you. Now, you see where the rub is, because right now, you may be under the illusion that your life belongs to you. And what we have to do is come to the conclusion that we are going to give our lives to Jesus and say, now my life belongs to you, which means it no longer belongs to me, which means God is in charge and I am not. And it means as I begin to run this race together with you, I do it with a new direction, a new goal, a new leader, a new purpose, and a new destination. And so I just would want to invite you right now, if you have not made that decision, now's the time to do it. And there is no script or pageantry or drama necessary. You just get alone right now where you are in your own head and turn your thoughts toward God. He's waiting to hear from you. So my first question would be, are you in? Are you one of the us? And it's not an exclusive us, as I've mentioned, because anyone can come in. But sometimes it's an excluding us because many people choose not to ever become part of this, this faith family, and begin to run this race. And if you're in, are you running this race like a sprint where you get pumped up and fired up for God and you run as fast as you can for 50 yards and then you fall to the ground exhausted, wheezing, saying, maybe I could never run again. And then eventually you read a book, listen to a sermon, go to a seminar. You get inspired. Maybe it's a week later, maybe a month later, maybe a year later, and you get up and begin to sprint again. Jesus is the Lord. I'm going to go. I'm going to live my life for him. And then you sprint. And then 40 or 50 yards later, you fall down and get tired in the same process over and over and over again. And this word picture, this life that we're called to is the life of, of running with purpose it's the life of the marathon. It's the life of putting things within our lives and removing things from our lives that allow us to be people of purpose and to accomplish what God's called for us to, uh, to accomplish and intended even before we were born. Now, I know that's a lot for a New Year's Eve. But I can't think of anything more important to share with you. And this is the reason. First of all, if you've chosen not to become part of the family of God, to keep your life for yourself, not to trust God with everything you are and want to become, then your eternity is in jeopardy. And it's not trendy or popular right now to talk about it, but it's real. And because I love you, I have to tell you that without a personal relationship with God, when a person dies and we don't know the day or the hour of our death, we don't go to spend eternity with him. A person who dies having chosen not to become part of the faith family doesn't just go into a soul sleep, an insignificant non-existence that the Bible teaches us that a person who rejects Jesus Christ and chooses not to become part of this faith family, when they die, they spend an eternity in active punishment in a real place called hell. And that's one of the best reasons I can think of to take this seriously. But let me take one step further because I don't believe that 
that a person would simply give their lives to Christ and become part of the us just to avoid hell. But I believe that you should consider what you really want out of the next number of years that you have left. How old are you? You don't have to answer. I turned 54 while we were gone, December 18th. And every time I say my age, there's half of you in here who are like, ah, oh, yeah, you're just a young pup. And then half of you in here look at me like I'm almost dead, right? <laughs> my wife and I had a 34 year wedding anniversary yesterday. I know. She put up with me that long. And last night in the middle of the cowboy game, I walked in and I said, hey, how many years do you think we got left? And Joy's like, well, that's romantic, right? <laughs> and I said, well, 34 years, I just turned 54, which I got married when I was barely 20. I have no idea how that worked. It, it, you know, God's grace and Joy's patience. How many years do you think we got left? You think we can go another 30 years together, babe? Hope so. Another 35? Hope so. Now, together is really important, right? That's what I want. But it's not just about the years you live. It's about what we do with the years that God gives. And what I have become acutely aware of is that we become the people we don't want to be unless we're doing something to change that now. And I've met far too many people who get to the end of their lives and look back with regret. Either because they never became part of the us and thought their way was better. Or they slipped into the us but lived with one foot in both worlds, never really getting started and running this race. And the thing that scares me more than just about anything else is the idea of dying with regret, with the idea that perhaps I've missed my purpose, which means I fail you and it means I fail God. And when I get to times like this, New Year's Eve's, I reflect, I look back over the last year, I look at next year and I ask the Lord, God, what is it that you want from me this next year? Because I'm not really interested in what I want for myself this next year. I know that if God said, here, here's a blank check, get what you want this year. I know I'd get to the end of the year and go, man, that wasn't what I wanted at all. I know that I'm, I'm 54, I've been there. But I get to these times like I know you are. And I raise my hand and I say, I want to be a different person in 2024. I want my heart to be softer. I want to be more approachable. I want people when I bump into them incidentally or intentionally to see Jesus. I want to leave behind drops of grace with the footsteps that we take as we walk through our lives. And the author of Hebrews is making an appeal to these people and he's saying, don't get tripped up. Don't let your own heads dictate your reality and your future hope. So my question to you is, are you in? Now, all of us raised our hands and says, there's things we want in 2024 that are different than we want in 2023. Not as many raised their hands when I said, are there things you're gonna do to make sure that things are different? And here's what I know for sure. If I do the same thing that I did in 2023 in the same way, then next year this time, I'll be standing right here in front of you with the same result I got last year, next year. And the same hand raised saying, yep, there's something I want, but I didn't do anything to get it. So that's the T that the writer of Hebrews is setting this passage up on. And he's saying, look at all the people who've gone before. Look how they gave their lives. Look how they lived. Look how they finished. They're waiting for us to finish so that they can cheer for you that you finished the race well. That as you die and leave the life behind without regret, you go on to future reward in heaven, leaving a legacy that points people toward Jesus. And not only can it be done, but it should be done. 
And I hope as intense as the subject is that it has your interest because the author of Hebrews goes on to explain exactly how we accomplish this. And it's not as hard as you might think if we're intentional. So I want to pray for you. We're going to sing a couple of songs and I just want you to reflect on your own lives. You're going to leave this place in just a few minutes and I can tell you what, the TV is going to be full of football, nothing wrong with that. You got things that are going on this evening that are New Year's related. Some of you will be up till midnight and some of you will be up till nine posting on social media how you don't stay up till midnight. <laughs> I know. We get up tomorrow, off we go. But right now you have a moment. You've got a pause. You have a gift. And so I want you to embrace it. Think deeply. Sing meaningfully. Respond accordingly. And then we'll come back up. And we won't take very long. And we're going to land this part of this passage. And most likely, because I took so long in this introduction, we'll pick right back up next week in this passage. And we'll develop this. And it may even take us the week after that. But it's worth it. And we are going to start well. Father... All right, well, you guys seriously messed me up because um, that really was just my introduction uh, that uh, we spent the last 25 minutes on. So I, I think it's super important because this is about getting started and getting started well. Um, but there's so much in this passage that I want to talk to you about. It's the practical stuff in this passage. And, you know, it just occurs to me that um, as you think about starting again, as you think about beginning something new, there are many things that come into your mind um, that uh, would haunt you. And one of those things is probably the fact that you just like me, like many people have failed before. And past failures can haunt you. Regret can be a paralyzer and trap you into thinking that there's no point in even trying again because you know exactly where it's going to end up. Unfortunately, sometimes the fitness industry depends on, on that. I go to a couple different gyms in town and I was talking to somebody, a manager at one of the gyms that I go to and, and they were hustling and bustling, lots of activity. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're getting ready for the January one rush. And I was like, yeah. And they go, yeah, it's kind of great for business because everybody comes and joins the gym. And then by three weeks into January, maybe February 1st, they're all gone. But they have to pay the rest of the year. Like it was some big secret, right? And I'm thinking, that's terrible to me. It, it actually made me sad. Because a business plan hinges around the fact that we have good intentions and we fail. Human nature teaches us that we fall so many times, the world shows us, is it even worth making one more effort? And the author of Hebrews starts out Hebrews 12 by saying, not only is it worth it, but look at the people who've done it. People who had fallen and failed time and time and time again. And if you don't remember what I'm talking about, you got to leaf back through these stories. You and I have talked about many of these stories together. Abraham, on his faith journey, lied about his wife being his sister and gave her up to a king, saying, hey, I don't want to die. And God still used him. Now, if you and I have done that, chances are we think our journey was over, right? Here I am. Failed once again. Why get up? Why dust myself off? Why start over? How much time did you and I spend on King David? In some ways, a colossal failure, but not in the important ways. What do you mean, Pastor? He was an adulterer, he was a murderer, he was an absent parent. He was a pragmatic leader in certain cases. 
And throughout his life of great highs, there were these mistakes and you scratch your head and you're going, I figured God would be done with him. How in the world would he keep using him? And do you know what? God used him and David kept going and he finished well. And so what I want to make sure you know, this is the thought. I've been over here during the music thinking about this, going, man, I wanted to do this whole thing this morning. You got to come back next week. You have to, because this stuff is so good. We're talking about putting aside the weight that just, that makes it impossible for us to run this race and all the things in our life that, that, that crowd out our good intentions and that trip us up and who we're supposed to focus on as we run. It's the practical side of this, but, but this is what I want, I want to leave you with. It's not too late to start over and you are not a failure no matter how many times you have failed. I do not care what life has told you or what the world has shown you. Because if you are in and you serve a new master, then he gives you the strength and the ability to run with purpose. And when you fall and as we fall, not only will he be there to pick you up, but we will be there to pick you up because friends, we run together. Us, let us, because that's how God intended it. And so I wanna pray for you And I really think the thing right now is to encourage you because my sense is that some of you feel like you've kind of been there and done that. And I want to remind you that your past does not dictate your future. And that if you trust in our God, he will never let you down. This next year, is gonna be the best year that you, that we have ever lived because we are gonna live it for God's glory with purpose, discipline, and intentionality because our world has to have it. People need Jesus and time is running out. And I am so excited to be doing this with you. I'm gonna pray for you. And I hope you have a great New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And one of the resolutions that I have made for you is that you are here on Sunday morning, every single Sunday morning, unless something crazy happens and you can't be here. Because putting things in your life that are consistent where you can focus your heart and your attention is so critically important to your development and you're running this race that I have been praying that God would remove some of the conflicts from some of our lives so that we can be disciplined in protecting this time together because this is where we take hands. We join hands and we take steps together as we accomplish God's purpose. Father, thank you.